Hello, everyone. Pastor Donnie here. Uh, thank you for choosing to watch one of our sermons today. You know, it's my hope and prayer. As the Bible says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. My hope is not you're, you're not just coming here and listening to something and moving on, but it's something that really just uh, the word enters deeply and richly into your soul in a transformative way that moves you towards Christ, moves you to see who he is in all of his beauty, in all of his faithfulness, and to see the gospel in a transformative way that, that completely just enlivens your soul and brings you new life today. Now, if that's something that's been going on, if, if you've been nourished by uh, the word through our ministry, would you consider giving? Uh, uh, in, in a way that we can use to source richer content. And also, we're not a large enterprise. We're not a huge organization. We've got lots of needs. So if you would consider giving to our ministry, we would be grateful to receive anything that you would consider giving to us. Go to metrophilly.org slash give. There's a number of ways and opportunities and options that you can use uh, to give. But as you listen to our sermon today, I just pray that it's something that just nourishes and blesses and encourages and strengthens your soul as you move on in your day and points you to Christ. Thank you for watching and God bless. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. You can follow along in your Bibles or in your online bulletin on page 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Verse 1 begins with, In the year that King Uzziah died, you need to know that King Uzziah was a very successful king. And during his reign, Israel prospered in every way, economically, politically, socially, culturally. But you also need to know that Israel never did well in times of prosperity. They became socially driven by wealth. They became culturally driven by prosperity. And so they became a selfish culture. They became a proud culture, a decadent culture, a self-indulgent culture. And as a result, the unity of the nation... The unity of God's people in its values, in its center, it was starting to erode throughout history in times of prosperity. When the culture of the society starts to get compromised, it begins its decline. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to pause for a second. You need to think about this. This is really important for our church right now in this juncture. It's really important for Metro. Why? Because as a church, as God's people, we are experiencing a remarkable period of growth. We are experiencing a remarkable period of stability and prosperity, but, well, then it's easy to become selfish. It's easy to become proud. It's easy to become self-indulgent in the church during these times. It's easy to lose sight of what brought us here, or what called us here, our values and our mission as a church. And then you start to begin to contribute to the erosion of this culture, its unity, its values, its center. And the context of this passage, remember, just years prior, another power, another empire was starting to rise up. It was the Assyrian Empire. They were beginning its rise, and they were sweeping across the nation. The Assyrians were on their way, but then their king, the Israelite king, Uzziah, he dies. 
And so you see the death of their king, the rise of a rival king, and what could Isaiah see? What could Isaiah see? What vision could he have in the midst of a national crisis that could enable Israel to face this type of crisis, this type of suffering, their future? In verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Now, Metro, you need to, you need to, we need to say this. We are in this time of, of prosperity, which means there are going to be times of crisis. There are going to be times of great brokenness. I mean, today is a day of favor. Some of you, you may be enjoying a time of favor right now. That day of favor in your lives, yourselves right now, you need to remember, don't get complacent. Don't get spiritually complacent. Don't get spiritually lazy. Don't get sleepy. Don't get smug. Don't get proud. Don't get selfish or unforgiving or uncharitable. This is a time, really, I mean, this passage is there for all of us to see. This is a time right now to look at ourselves, and as a church, you need to fight. You need to fight for those values, the calling that God has given you, the values of the church, uh, the culture, our gospel culture. Well, where do you start? Isaiah, he says, I saw the Lord. And whatever he saw of God that day, verse 5, he says, woe to me. Woe to me, cursed is me, I am ruined, my eyes have seen the king. Whatever he saw, it ruined him. Then in verses 6 to 7, it saved him. Then in verse 8, here am I, send me, it sent him, it empowered him. And if Isaiah, if Israel, if Israel had to see this, well then Metro, you individually, us as a body, we need to see this. Four things, what did he see? Why did it ruin him? How did it save him? How did it send him? What Isaiah saw, why it ruined him, uh, how it saved him, and how it sent him. Isaiah is in a crisis, this time of crisis, and he needed to see God, and he did. God came to him. Well, what did he see? Verses 1 to 3, he says, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. Now, in other words, Isaiah, he saw a big God. So big that he's on the throne, and yet the train of his robe was in the temple. It filled the temple. On one hand, God resides competently, competently on the throne. Later in verse 5, he says, my eyes have seen the king. The Lord Almighty, but on the other hand, God dwells majestically in his temple. He fills the temple, you see. And so, on one hand, God's competently on the throne. On the other hand, he's residing in the temple. He's a king and he's a priest. And in verse 3, the angels, they're present. They're calling to one another. They're singing, holy, holy, holy. Now, think about this. Isaiah, he's a prophet. He's called by God. That means, at the very least, he's heard God. At the very least, he was likely moved by God. At the very least, it means he probably experienced God, which means he probably felt God, he sensed the presence of God, but on this day, he saw God. He encountered him. It was real. He saw him. Rudolf Otto, he's a German philosopher. In 1917, he published a book, his seminal work, uh, a book called The Idea of the Holy. And in this book, Rudolf Otto, he tries to explain the concept of holiness, And basically what he says is, if you ever encounter anyone that is supremely beautiful, if you ever encounter somebody that's supremely great, that's kind of like the idea of holiness. There's a kind of separateness about them. They're set apart. It's what he calls the numinous. He says, when you encounter someone like that, when they come near to you, there's a strange and yet equal sense of fascination and fear about them. On one hand, you're drawn to them. You're drawn to their beauty. You're drawn to their genius. You're drawn to their gifts. But on the other hand, when they come near to you, you want to hide. There's a sense of fear. You're afraid. I'm going to put it in more of our modern context. It's one thing to hear about Michael Jordan. It's one thing to watch him play from a distance in the stands. But it's a whole other experience if you're in the room or if you're on the court with Michael Jordan. Isaiah here, he's in the room with God. 
He's in the room with God. And the angels, they're calling out to each other. Verse 5, holy, holy, holy. This is God. God is in the room. I mean, you watch a movie like The Ten Commandments, an old movie like The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, and you see depictions of God, the shiny depiction of who God is. It will never do justice. It's a poor depiction of who God is, what he looks like. I mean, this is not just a beautiful person. This is beauty. This is not just a powerful person. This is power. This is not just a wise person. This is all wisdom. This is not just a good person. This is goodness personified, in a sense. His beauty is so beautiful. His brilliance is so brilliant. His goodness is so good. In verse 2, the angels, they cover their eyes. They cover their eyes and their feet. Notice, they don't cover their ears. Why? Because on one hand, you want to hide. But the beauty is so beautiful, you want to draw near. You see? You want to draw near. You want to be close. The beauty is so beautiful. You're drawn. You're fascinated. But, you see, at the same time, you can't see. And so they hear, and they sing, and they worship. And they want to run, but they can't. You see, they cover their feet. Feet represents modesty. In the Old Testament, it always represents, uh, it can represent a sense of nakedness. And so they covered their feet. Why? In the presence of holy, holy, holy. They cover, they, they become modest. They want to hide, but they can't. Why? Because they're drawn. They're fascinated. And so they cover up. Holy, holy, holy. We tend to think that if you're a good person, that good people are boring, that good people are dull. It's that bad boy. It's that sinful person that's exciting and fascinating. But the Bible says that it's because you've never seen real purity. It's because you've never seen real goodness. Because real goodness is endlessly exciting, endlessly fascinating, endlessly rich, so much so that it makes sin and evil and selfishness dull. Think about it. I mean, there's nothing more dull than a very selfish person. But the God of the Bible, he's infinitely beautiful, infinitely good, and so everyone is fascinated. He's infinitely fascinating. And they're drawn to him. And look, verses 1 to 3, Isaiah, he sees how big God is. He is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. That word glory means weightiness. That word glory means substantiveness. He matters. In other words, if something is weightier than a rock, if something weightier than a rock falls on top of a mountain, what, what do you get? You get a landslide. If something weightier than ice falls on top of a mountaintop of snow, what happens? You get an a- avalanche, you see? Is something weightier than the earth. There's something under, underground is shaking the earth. It, you get an earthquake. That's the glory of, of, of the weight right there. When, when the reality uh, or the, of the presence of something weighty comes in, when it comes near, it changes everything that's around it. And so when you're in the presence of Michael Jordan, when you're in the presence of the President of the United States, in the room, it changes the room. It shapes the ruin. People start to revolve around that person. But think about this. If you're in the presence of the sun, the sun in the solar system, I mean, it's way weightier. There's gravity there. It changes all matter in the system. Everything moves relative to the sun in that system. In verse 3, what do you read? The entire earth, the whole earth is full of God's glory. This is the ultimate weightiness. That means the presence of God in our lives on the earth, it changes everything around us. And in verse 5, what happens? It ruins Isaiah. It just completely breaks Isaiah. And then in verses 6 and 7, it redeems him. And then in verse 8, it reinvigorates him. Why does it ruin him? Why does it destroy Isaiah? In verse 3, the angels, they're calling to one another. They're singing, holy, holy, holy. You need to know that in the Hebrew language, there are no superlatives. Here in the English language, something can be good, better, best. But in Hebrew, when you say something is good, and if you really want to push the envelope, you say it's good, good. That's how it's written. Repetition corresponds to magnitude. 
Repetition corresponds to intensity. There's, an, there's emotional intensity. There's a magnitude of expression. There's, there's high intensity there. So when King David's son, Absalom, who betrayed him, who conspired against David, when he died, King David says what? Absalom, my son, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, my son. He's constantly repeating twice. There's a doublet. Parents, I mean, you cannot even, heaven forbid, you cannot even conceive the experience of losing your own child. I mean, the intensity, the magnitude of sorrow, the magnitude of grief, the magnitude of emotion, and the intensity of that, I mean, heaven forbid, uh, you would never be the same. It changes you, and yet in Hebrew, that is only a doublet. That is, uh, that expression, that magnitude, that intensity is repeated in just, my son, my son, you see? But here, the angels and the seraphs, they're calling out, not holy, Not holy, holy, but holy, holy, holy. It's tripled. You never see that anywhere else in the Bible. This is the ultimate superlative, the only time it's ever used, and it's used to describe God. And when Isaiah saw the presence of God, what's his response? Woe to me. Woe to me. Cursed is me. He's saying, I'm ruined. I'm falling apart. I've come coming undone. Why? For I am a man of unclean lips. Remember, Isaiah, he's a prophet. That means he's an orator. His mouth is his moneymaker, you see? And yet, what he's saying, he's likely a member of Israel's elite class. He was royalty. He was likely related to the king. I mean, that's very unique because most prophets, they were, they were born or they come from a lower class. Um, So because of his speech, I mean, Isaiah was the type of person that would draw people. When he spoke, people listened. They gathered hundreds, maybe thousands. That's what he was known for. That's his gift. Perhaps he was the greatest orator in his generation. And because of his background, and I mean, he's supposed to be proud. This is a big person. He's supposed to be proud, uh, uh, proud, but not here. At the sight of God, he says, I'm cursed. I'm ruined. He's speechless. Why? By the way, this is a perfect setup for you. This is the perfect setup for folks at Metro. You know why? Because most of you, most of you are Isaiah's. You're educated. You're studying where you studied. Your gifts, you have great gifts. You're developing gifts. That's why you're in the big city. You're accomplished. Many of you wealthy. You've got status. You've got connections. But when Isaiah sees God, the real God, he's crushed. Why? I mean, friends, you know that when you have status, you rely on your status. When you are wealthy, you tend to rely on your wealthiness in a way that it defines you. You start to look at other people based on how much wealth they have compared to you. You start to look at your, your own wealth and compare your own person, your own well-being, your own sense of worth based on, based on how wealthy you are compared to another person. When you have gifts, you tend to rely on your gifts. You start to compare other people based on relative to your own gifts. Now think about this. That's what makes me wealthy, or that's what makes me weighty, we say. It gives me worth. It gives me a sense of glory. But here, Isaiah, he says, even at my best, he's an orator, the greatest in his generation, My gifts have cursed me. I am a man of unclean lips. He's an orator. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. That means with all my gifts, now that I see God, I've never done justice to God. All that I've ever spoken about God, I've never done justice. Not this God, not the one that I see here. I mean, this this is God on the throne, high and exalted, So big, just the train of his robe fills the temple. He's so big, he's on the throne and in the temple. And Isaiah realizes, I am worthless. Until this this day, it's like Isaiah, he, he may have just understood God as a concept, heard his voice and understood the calling. And it's easy to put your worth inside that calling too, isn't it? We do that all the time in our jobs, don't we? Until this point, maybe he saw God as just a friend, somebody who is with him, someone who listens to his prayers. But today he sees him on the throne and in the temple. He is a king and his priest. He is a king, his king, the ultimate king and the ultimate high priest. It's remarkable. It's like Isaiah has been in this dimly lit room all of his life and he's looking into a mirror 
When you look at yourself in a dimly lit room, it doesn't look too bad, does it? That's me every morning. It doesn't look too bad. And, and then the lights come on and you're like, whoa, <laughs> yikes. You see, that's Isaiah. Dear friends, friends, you are gifted. You are talented. You have money. You have status, connections, amazing qualities. We've got great thinkers here, great planners here. We've got uh, great leaders here, great teachers here, great healers here. But are you great kneelers here? Because great kneelers, they put aside the status. Great kneelers, they put aside their opinions. Great kneelers, they put aside their egos. Great kneelers, they put aside the comparisons. That part of you that wants to fight. And I mean, great kneelers, they look at themselves first. You know why we don't? It's because... We forgot to see, we forgot God on the throne and in the temple. We forgot God. I didn't say you forgot about God. You're here, you're worshiping, you're singing, you're praying. You didn't forget about God. You forgot God on the throne, in the temple, high and exalted, so brilliant, so beautiful, so weighty, he shakes the earth. The whole earth is full of his glory. The high king is on the throne. The high king is on the throne, and so, and, and, but we forget, to, we forget that we need his mercy, and so we're not merciful. The high priest is in the temple. We forget that we need his sacrifice, and so we don't give. We forget that we need his forgiveness, and so we are not charitable. We are judging. We are not forgiving. But if you want to be moved and move others, if you want to be shaped and shape others. If you want to be led and lead others, then you need to go through cycles of experiencing your own pride, your sinfulness, and go through deep, deep repentance. You need to fall to the ground the way Isaiah did. If someone hasn't called you out recently on your pride, it's there then. That's probably why. If someone in this room hasn't called you out on your pride, it's likely something that's insidious and growing and brewing in you, and it, may, it might have taken hold of you already. And it's digging its heels into you. See, Isaiah, he's not just generally saying, oh, I'm a weak person. He didn't see God, holy, holy, holy. The entire earth is full of his glory. And he didn't sit there and say, wow, I'm really weak. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, yeah, I get it. I'm a sinner. That's not what he said Here. I mean, today, one of the key buzzwords in our modern generation is what? Authenticity. We want, you know, nowadays, all of our Instagrams and social media, the idea is to portray ourselves to be authentic. How do you really become authentic? What is authenticity? Real authenticity. Uh, Kind of ironic in saying it that way, but what is real authenticity? Isaiah is in the presence of a real, living, holy God, and only through him, is he able to see who he really is? Only through him can your real self actually come out. How do you know? You don't just say, well, I guess I'm weak. I'm just a weak person. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We don't say that in general. It ruins us. It brings us down because you realize that God is everything and needs nothing, and you, at your best, are nothing and need everything. You see that? You need his mercy. You come home from work one day, and of course, behold, there's a tax man at your door. Turns out you've owed a lot of back taxes. What do you do? Now, until you know the size of your debt, you will not know what you owe, what you pay, what you need to pay. But what if you owe a billion dollars? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? But some people do, right? What if you owe a billion dollars? I mean, all of a sudden, your heart's got palpitations. You want to run away. You want to have a heart attack. You think you're going to die. But then the guy says, well, hold on. Don't worry. I said you owed a billion dollars. I'm just here to give you a receipt. It looks like the debt's been paid. What? The debt's been paid? There's this note with the receipt. It's from a dear friend of yours. And it says, you need to know that I've been a multimillionaire. 
and I've loved you all my life. And I heard of this debt, and I was broken by. There's no way you can pay. And so I paid the debt for you, and I hope that you know my love for you one day that you will be with me and that you will marry me. Tax man's like, he saved your life, bro. <laughs> she saved your life. My favorite book is Pride and Prejudice. Um, at the end of the book, Elizabeth Bennett, Lizzie Bennett, she realizes that this man, this wealthy man, the wealthiest she's ever known, uh, somebody that she despised, professes his love for her. She insults this man. But behind the scenes, he's working to save her reputation, the reputation of her family, the reputation of his, her sister, her life. And when he, she finally encounters him again, she sees him in a different light. And he's like, surely you must know it was all for you. Friends, why do we need to know our debt? It's because until you see the debt, you don't know whether to send the Lord a thank you card or to fall down, kneel at his feet, and worship him. You understand? Yes, Metro, you're gifted, and you're teachers, and you're leaders, and you're pastors. But it's rough up in the streets. It's dark. It's difficult. It's treacherous. The only way that you're going to get there alive, you need to remember God. Don't forget that a real encounter with God, it undoes your own wisdom, it undoes your opinions, it undoes your insights, it undoes your status and your wealth and your education, all these things that you've accumulated that you th say, this is what makes me, this is the measure of who I am. In verse 4, that's why it says that the doorposts and the thresholds shook. They shook at just the sound of the angels. We're not even hearing God's voice. This is just at the sound of the angels speaking about God. It's because the frame and the foundations of our lives, they need to shake. They need to be undone. They need to be ruined because Isaiah forgot about God. How do you know that Isaiah is repenting? It's because he doesn't just say, I'm a sinner. He doesn't just say, oh, I get it, I'm unclean, I know. He doesn't do that. He's not just repenting of his sin. He's not just repenting of his bad things. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Remember, his lips are his gift to God. His lips are his goodness. This is what makes him great. This gift, what he thought separated him from all the other people, he was repenting of that too. He says, that is unclean too. You see, his righteousness, his goodness, his own separateness, what separates him from other people, you need to be brought to ruin by a real high and exalted and holy God only to remember then, only to be brought into. When you really see him, then you see his intimacy and his grace and his love because only that and only that will truly save you and send you. Well, how did it save Isaiah? One, in verse six, one of the seraphs, the angels, they flew to Isaiah with a live coal taken with tongs from the altar of God. That's what it says. And essentially what happens is God sends his angel, an angel with a burning coal, a fiery coal. And in verse seven, it touches Isaiah's lips. The li a live coal means it's a fiery coal. There's fire. Fire in the Old Testament, it represents the purifying judgment, the purifying wrath of God. What's an altar? An altar is a place of atonement. And so you got this, that with tongs from the altar, the angels picking up a fire representing judgment and wrath and purity, right, from the rat, with the wrath of God. And he's taking it with, from the altar of sacrifice, the atonement. So a sacrifice has been laid. It's, it's where sins are paid for. It's where you're forgiven. Think about this. A real holy God is not the same as a God that most of, the God that most of us were raised to know. Most of us was, were raised with, with that demanding God, that, that angry, bitter, demanding God that says, you know, you better obey or you are out. You better obey or I will sacrifice you. You better obey or there will be blood and wrath and you are dead. A real, the real God is not like that. Why? Oh, because that, that would be mean? No. <laughs> because that would be harsh and God isn't like that? No, actually, no. The real God is not like that because it's not enough. It's not enough. 
You see, we tend to be like, well, I'm a good guy. I obey. People respect me in the church. And as a result, that gives us liberties to say and act how we feel because, you see, I'm a wise person. I'm one of the insightful people. I'm one of the good people. That's Isaiah, you see? It isn't until Isaiah is brought to ruin by the holiness of God that is really able to be healed by his grace. Our sins, all of us, all of us. The Bible says we owe a debt to God and it needs to be paid. The tax man has come. It needs to be paid. That's why Isaiah says, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. My sin debt is huge and I cannot pay. What does God do? From the fiery altar of the temple... There's coal and smoke. Again, this is the judging wrath of God, but a sacrifice has been laid. And from there, the sacrifice has been laid, blood has been spilt, right? Why? Because one, Isaiah is confessing sin. But he's also confessing that his gifts are insufficient to save. So that coal is needed. The fire, the purifying wrath of God, what was intended for wrath and judgment now becomes a purifying factor in his life. It cleanses his lips. Why? Because that's his gift. He's saying even that needs to be cleansed. And secondly, because he confessed. He was specific. A lot of us, I mean, it's my prayer that this is not the case, but some of you, there's so much pride there that You can't get beyond just admitting that you are a sinner in general. And you are so focused on things done to you, you do not realize the havoc that you wreak on other people. Isaiah confesses. That's what he does. He confessed the very thing that he needed, that, that, that he needs grace to cover over him, the, the grace to change everything, his sin and his pride, his flaws and his gifts. Otherwise, when you go to God, you're going for things because you're a good person. And so you don't really go to God like you owe him. You go to God like he owes you. You see what I'm saying? That gets confusing, awfully confusing when you're worshiping. Because you're on one hand, you know you need to worship him, and yet you're going to him acting like you're a good person, and you believe that in yourself, and so you're not really going to God for God fully. But yes, there's that side of you that's worshiping, and it gets awfully confusing. There's mixed messages that you yourself are sending to God because you've got gifts, and it's almost like God owes you. You're going to God really not because of his beauty, but because he wants something. You want power. You want wisdom. <sighs> How do you know? that you're really going to God because of his beauty or because of something else, his power or his wisdom? And the answer is, like Isaiah, if you experience the holiness of God, it doesn't matter what you get from him. It doesn't matter when you receive it from him, you see. It doesn't matter when you receive power or if you receive wisdom or things. You're ruined, but then you're redeemed. And now there's nothing that God cannot ask of you. You see that? That's the fruit. The fruit of being redeemed, the fruit of being saved by God is there is now nothing that, I can't ask, that he cannot ask of me. Because being near God, being near his beauty, being near his brilliance, being near his holiness, that matters more than anything. It matters more than finding a spouse. It matters more than raising perfect children. It matters more than your time. It matters more than how how self-important you feel. You see, it matters more than how much you've been hurt. It matters more than, than the anger that you have against your parents. It matters more than how much you need to strive to get to a certain point before you're 30 or 35 or 40 or 50. You see? Secondly, I mean, why the fire? This fire, this coal, it doesn't consume Isaiah. It cures him. It was intended to consume, and yet it cures him and heals him and saves him. How? There is a temple. There is the fire. It's shaking. It's smoking. It's all set up, and Isaiah knows what this is about. These are all signs of wrath and the judgment of God. But in verse 7, the angel says, See, your guilt has been taken away, and your sin is atoned for. I mean, if the fire, if the purifying wrath of God, how does it purify without killing? What does that mean? Isaiah hears these voices, the shaking, the smoke, that means wrath, it means judgment. He thought he was going to die, but he didn't. And actually, he's renewed, and he's reinvigorated, and he's sent out. Why? Because centuries later, 
Jesus Christ is at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know what he's saying? I'm ruined. I'm ruined. I'm coming undone. I'm falling apart. Why? Because he sees the fire as well. He sees the wrath. He sees the judgment. And he sees what he is going to endure on the cross. And it completely just tears him apart. It ruins him. And when Jesus Christ is on the cross, what happened? The ground shook. There's an earthquake. There's darkness. There's gloom. There's judgment. It's all happening around him. Isaiah is saying the temple is shaking. I'm ruined because I deserve the judgment. And yet he's saved. Why? Because on the cross... Jesus Christ experiences the real fiery wrath of God as the ultimate penalty, as the sacrifice for our sins. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he's saying is, this is the ultimate fire. This is the crushing wrath of God on me. I am being sacrificed. I don't deserve the judgment, but I'm receiving the judgment. Why? Because this king is the ultimate high priest who did not come to bust out judgment on us, but to bear judgment for us, you see? And so he says, I'm being ruined. I'm falling apart. I'm undone. Why? Because God has departed from me. You can say in a sense, forensically, that the Holy Spirit, that, that, that God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, that your Trinity is being ripped apart as Jesus is being separated from God, the Father. God is holy, 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 separateness to completely other. And now Jesus has been cast out on the cross. He experiences the fiery wrath of God on the cross. The temple shook, the curtain, the temple's literally shaking, just like in the time of Isaiah. The, cur- the curtain that t- divides the, the innermost part of the temple where God dwells and his people is torn in two. And yet Jesus is saying, I am quaking on the inside because the Father has departed from me. The holy fire of God has completely and totally consumed me. And when that sacrifice is done, that work is done, he says what? It is finished. Friends, you know what that means in the Greek? It is finished. The debt is paid. He is the ultimate king who is the ultimate high priest who is the ultimate sacrifice on the altar of the cross. Our sins have been atoned for. And that same holy God that stripped Isaiah, that same holy God that ruined Isaiah, that same uh, holy God that ruined Isaiah of his own self-righteousness, he ruined Jesus Christ on the cross. And when that holy God, when you encounter him and he ruins you, he can save you and he can heal you. And he can empower you and strengthen you. And that God will then rebuild you, remake you, recreate you for all eternity. And that's the God that is sending you. That's what empowered Isaiah. And that's what will empower you. That's what sent Isaiah. That's what will send you. How did it send? The next verses, we didn't actually read it. Um, But God says, this is essentially God says to Isaiah, I need someone to go and preach to a people that are never going to listen. They're never going to hear. They're never going to understand. They have ears, but they will never understand. They will have eyes, but they will never perceive. In other words, I I need a prophet, and this prophet is going to be there for decades, preaching to a people who are going to be deaf to them. You see? They're never going to get it, no matter how hard you try to preach, no matter what you say, how you say it, what approach you take, they are not going to listen to you. Their hearts are calloused. And the decline is coming. The Assyrians are on their way in full swing. My people are going to endure suffering and hurt and blood and tears. They're going to be taken away. Who'd like to go and share this message? Remember, Isaiah used to preach and people would just come. Basically, God's saying, this prophet is going to fail completely. Verse 8, Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. I'll go. Where do you get that kind of inspiration? Where do you get that kind of confidence? It's because he saw God. He saw the real God. That means he sees the past, the present, and the future. You see? It's sealed for him. It enabled him to see himself clearly. His own self-righteousness, it brought him down. It humbled him. The holy God brought him down, but his love, his grace lifted him up. And through the doorway of his own sin, he saw the fullness of God's grace, the atonement that was made for him. And that 
made everything real, made everything matter. It gave him the confidence to go. There was nothing that God could no longer ask of him. What about you? Do you have that kind of humility, friends? Do you have that kind of confidence to say, maybe my prayers won't be answered? Maybe that thing that I really want, maybe I won't get it, or maybe I won't get it now. Maybe it might be a while. But I'm coming to you for you because I see you and I realize nothing could ever replace you. Isaiah was rebuilt with a resilience that only comes through faith in the atonement that was made for him. For him. And that gave him the confidence to go. All his sins are redeemed. What does he need to fear anymore? Is he going to be afraid that people don't gather? Is he going to be afraid that he doesn't have a huge crowd anymore? He's not going to fear failure anymore? Before, when you built your self-esteem on your gifts and your accomplishments, then it's only until you fail that your self-esteem will hold up. If you build it on your looks, it's only going to be until you get old or no longer young or you no longer feel beautiful anymore or somebody prettier or better looking or with a better physique or a better figure appears. You see that? If, you've, if it's based on your talents and your gifts or your salary, it's, you know how fragile we are? Isaiah no longer fears that they won't listen, that they won't see. He's going to serve. He's going to share. He says, here am I. Send me because he's been healed by God. There's the only validation that he needs. And that gave him an unshakable poise. You know what that's called? It's called holiness. That's what it is. Holiness. He has set himself apart now for God, to be used only by God in his life, in his work, among his people, in the church. His calling was rooted in faith in who? King Uzziah. Remember, King Uzziah ruled for like more than 50 years. Now he's gone. He's got every reason to be afraid. The Assyrians are on the way. They have no more leader. Not Isaiah. Many of you are living in a time when King Uzziah died. Many of you, you're worried about something. Oh, you're anxious about something. You're depressed about something. You're angry about something something that you're about to lose, something that you could lose, you're rooted in it. Isaiah says, I learned to be stripped of these things because they became my righteousness. I've learned to be rooted in the unchanging beauty and brilliance of a holy God, the Lord, who is my king and my high priest. And that gave him poise. It's the only source of poise, unending poise. He says, so I will go. Will you join him? Will you go? Who will go for him? Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you, and Lord, this is one of those How can we do justice to your holiness and your beauty? Only only somebody that you've saved, only somebody whose heart that you are opening can understand and grasp the reality of your presence and what it means to be in your presence. So, Lord, it's my prayer that you would have opened our hearts today, that in the presence of your holiness we get to be drawn into intimacy by your love and your grace alone. And so, Father, as we respond in song, help us to reflect on that beauty and brilliance and holiness. And, Lord, help us to then put aside our egos and our comparisons and our judgments of others and judgments of the world, and especially in this crazy political climate that we're in right now, And Lord, help us to focus on what matters because you are present. That means we are all, we all must revolve around you. So lead us then in that incredible cosmic orbit around Jesus Christ, our King and Lord and Savior and High Priest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
If you are encouraged by today's teaching and are looking for a gospel community, we invite you to join us. To learn more, visit metrophilly.org. To give, visit metrophilly.org slash give.